All right, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Corey Lampert from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Corey is the head of digital collections at UNLV Libraries, where she is responsible for operations and strategic planning for a dynamic department that comprises digitization facilities, several digital collection systems and technologies, and grant-funded projects such as the Nevada Digital Newspaper Program. Corey's research interests are in the areas of linked open data, strategic planning for digital libraries, and mentorship of new librarians. When not working on digital libraries and metadata, she likes hiking in the peaks of the Mountain West. You should come to Denver for that, too. Uh, thank you again, Corey. Whenever you're ready, it's over to you. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me at this symposium today. I'm really excited to be here. And I appreciate all the work that Jeremy and Christina have done to put all the logistics together and the presenters I'm here with today. Um, I'm really looking forward to your presentations. So today, I wanted to talk about um, some of the work we're doing at UNLV to explore linked open data and specifically how semantic richness can, af can affect the search, retrieval, and research experience for humanities and art researchers um, by revealing all sorts of very interesting relationships between items in our collections. So for this presentation, I'm going to cover um, just an overview of the UNLV Linked Data Project. And I'm going to talk about why it is that we have focused in on metadata as the source of rich but currently hidden information on relationships. And I'm going to share some practical tips that anyone working in cultural heritage institutions can do right now to prepare for linked open data, even if you're not ready to take on your own project. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the ways that visualizing linked open data offers us new research opportunities and new ways of looking at the information that we hold in our repositories. So to start with, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our project, which is really an exploration of linked open data, taking it from the theory that we hear about at conferences into practical applications that we're using in um, our workflows here at UNLV. So we began with hearing a lot about linked open data and knowing that there was a buzz in the field, but not really having a clear picture of what we were supposed to do about it. So with our curiosity and some professional development training funds, we decided to tried to form a, a UNLV linked open data study group where we could explore and pilot a practical project with data that we had in our library. And the goal of the project was to try to take data that we had access to and responsibility for and transform it into linked open data and just see how feasible is this. You know, is this something that real librarians can actually do. And the good news is it's, it's possible. We did it. And the project resulted in some really interesting future questions. And we found that by sharing what we had done and what we had learned, that there was a lot more um, that we felt like we could do. And by putting the project into less of a pilot and into more of a production, mode, we've begun to see some compelling results that we can actually start to evaluate and assess. But um, much of the project's questions have just blossomed into um, lots and lots and lots of other future research areas. So it's good to keep a sense of humor in this kind of a project. So you might be asking, what motivated us to embark upon this project? And you can see that the potential of linked open data compared to our current practice has some interesting contrasts. Right now, we have our objects in our digital collections encapsulated in records in a repository. And these records are assigned to arbitrary collections. 
and very few links are created within or across these collections to show people relationships between the material. If we do want to show people, we often have to manually create that link. And the links that we create often don't tell people a lot of context. And what we're hoping to do with linked open data is break out of this structure that's hiding all sorts of links and relationships and free the metadata from its silos, where researchers can actually see much more interesting, rich relationship information between items. And these items can be linked with other objects in our collections, in our repositories, and in other repositories as well. When the data becomes machine readable and linked to other data sets, there are all sorts of exciting ways to discover and query the data that offer more precise searching and opportunities for researchers to repurpose the data. So we got excited and decided to um, continue with the project. And I thought that maybe I'd stop here and just ask those of you who are, who are listening to this, if you have any interest in doing practical work with linked open data at your institution, there is a little checkbox in the attendee box or participants box. If you're interested, you can just check mark the um, yes button. And that'll give me kind of a sense if there are folks here who are um, interested in embarking on some typical type of linked data project like ours. So when we decided to go forward, we just we had to come up with some sort of a scope for the for the pilot project. Our digital collections currently consist of all sorts of unique materials documenting the history of Southern Nevada. They're stored in a content DM repository. And we initially focused on visual material collections because we felt that those had the most um, richness and we had the best descriptions for them. And I, I copied in here a def definition of linked open data that we've used to guide this project. And I wanted to highlight that we are talking about linked data that refers to a set of best practices for both publishing and interlinking data on the web. If this is a new concept to you, one um, resource that I'd like to recommend is the five-star data model diagram. And this is linked at the bottom of the slide. It's really an interesting way to quickly learn the difference between something like your Dublin Core metadata exported into a spreadsheet and linked open data, which is machine readable, not proprietary, and able to be shared with others and linked in the linked data cloud. So I use that diagram quite often to come up with elevator speeches to talk to administrators and other people who are not working on linked open data. So I recommend taking a look. So before we started the project, we decided that we wanted to start with our metadata records. And our goal would be to attempt to transform from an export of content DM metadata um, all of our showgirls uh, collection into linked open data triples. So I work here at UNLV. We're in Las Vegas. We've got a showgirls costume design collection. And we figured, what the heck, you know, this will be a really visually interesting collection to work with. So that's the one that we started with. And I thought that maybe to just give you an idea of what linked data looks like compared to our current situation, that I'd show you um, a graphical representation of one of our collection records. So in the center, you'll see our friend Frank Sinatra. And he's pictured with a theatrical producer, Jack Entratter. And so this is. Um, an item or a thing in our collection, and it depicts a person, Frank Sinatra, who's the subject. So right there, if you just follow that line, that is a graphical representation of a linked data triple marked with natural language text that humans can read. So if you take this and you transform it using unique resource identifiers instead of those words, you basically have a linked data triple. And you can see that one triple leads to another triple leads to another. So this is just a small sample of some of the possible triples we could create from one item in our collection. 
Now that item is just one of many in many different collections. So Frank Sinatra is in our Showgirls collection. He has performed with Showgirls at a particular club, and that club has a menu that's also digitized in, in our repository. And that club is also situated within a casino that is in our architecture collection. Unfortunately, I know this because I work here, but our users don't always know this. And it can be very, very difficult for people who may come in via Google and find the image of Frank Sinatra to know about all the other related materials and how they are related. So you can see if we expand our graphical representation to take on the, the records I just showed, then all of a sudden our graph becomes much more um, vibrant. And once again, this is just a small selection of the things that we could be showing um, our users but are not currently doing. So our photo of Frank Sinatra depicting Jack Entratter, it could also be identified as Jack Entratter producing the Ziegfeld Follies, which was presented at the Sands Hotel, which has an architectural drawing. And our triples go on and on and on. So this is the, the basic you know, premise of linked open data. And I hope that the diagrams kind of help to explain a little bit of how we're trying to transform from the metadata record into a more rich and dynamic. Um, view of the information. So I hope those diagrams helped a little bit. So next I wanted to talk a little bit about the goals that we established for the project. It was really focused on developing a common process because we did not want to have to do a different transformation process for each collection. So we focused on a, a common repeatable process that would allow us to convert the collection records into linked data, preserving their original expressivity and richness. And I want to stop here and just make a comment that this is a very important part of the project. You might be asking yourself, why are two random librarians so interested in linked open data? And why should I be interested? And I just want to make the case here that we did investigate what various library vendors and aggregators were doing with linked open data. And there is a lot of work in this area. For instance, we use Content DM, and our records are, don't, are um, shared with OCLC's WorldCat um, Collection Gateway. And they are producing a version of linked open data. And so there's part of us that said, why the heck are we going to go to the trouble? Well, the reason is, is that as the metadata is aggregated or is shared in a larger environment, the Dublin Core metadata becomes less rich the further it gets away from the data contributor. And we found that whereas we might have a record with 14 different fields and detailed information. OCLC's linked open data might just have the title, the language, and maybe the date, or you know just a few fields. So we really felt that there is a responsibility for those of us close to, closest to the content and who know the content and work with curators of the content to preserve the semantic richness in linked open data and not just let this be given over to library vendors and have them do it for us because they don't want to normalize data and they don't, they don't have as much investment in the data as we do. So we did end up publishing our data from our linked open data project and we've been exploring how it increases discoverability and connections with other data sets. So to start with, I wanted to show, um, this is not a presentation on how to do the transformation, but just as a reference, uh, these are some of the actions and technologies that are important to the process. Our first phase is cleaning up our data. And much to um, OCLC or Content DM's um, dismay, the first thing we do is we take it out of their repository. The next thing we do is we import it 
and use a tool called OpenRefine to prepare the data for an automatic reconciliation process. And what that means is any of our digital objects that are using controlled vocabularies that are um, linked data ready, such as the Library of Congress subject headings, can be reconciled without manual human intervention. And that process can happen using the OpenRefine tool. After we've reconciled and generated triples, we export the RDF from OpenRefine and we bring it into a different open source system called Virtuoso, which is a triple store. And it's just a data repository um, for linked open data that can be queried. So after the project concluded, we learned a lot, um, mostly that we were very excited to transform the data, but most people didn't really care that much about it because they couldn't see it. And so I do want to emphasize that um, all this work with linked open data um, does require visualization tools, and it does require end users being able to access it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about our future projects. But the pilot quickly turned into a project and into a production workflow that we're using for all of our collections now. And moving into the next phase has driven us to carefully examine what we're doing in terms of our metadata workflow um, so that we can focus on expressing those links and relationships. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about how our approach has changed since the pilot project. After we learned the concepts of linked open data, and we applied a data model. By the way, we're using the Europeana data model. And after we tested the technologies we needed, the process became repeatable. And we realized that the transformation process was actually not the hard part of linked open data. Rather, the sustainability of the process really depends a lot on the data quality of the material you're working with. And for most of us, we know that that data quality begins with whatever existing me metadata comes with the collections. Um, sometimes you have it, and sometimes you don't. And so many lessons from our pilot um, have basically informed revisions to how we practice metadata in our department. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done to change our metadata process and things that, that anyone can do who, who works with collections and metadata. So you'll see here in this photograph, um, right now our metadata is kind of towards the left. It's a little bit dumb. And it doesn't do much for us. And we've noticed through our linked data project that we really need to evolve our metadata to something a little bit smarter and that can be leveraged in more sophisticated ways. So we're looking to try to evolve to a more sapient kind of metadata. And you may be asking, well, when should we start preparing sapient metadata? And my answer would be, let's start right now. And the reason I say that is that metadata is so important to conveying the semantic richness and the context that researchers want. It was very interesting to me to um, connect this concept to the idea of image retrieval, because so much of what we see when people are here on the reference desk asking questions about our collections are about not um, simply how many photos do you have of this person, but do you have this photograph of this person showing particular things or showing um, evidence of their relationship with someone else. And these are the kinds of things that I think linked open data offers new opportunities for researchers. But those relationships can only be expressed if the metadata is of a quality that um, can be transformed in a way that reveals relationships. So what do we need to do to adapt the metadata quality? Well, one major thing that needs to happen is that if not already in use, well-established controlled vocabularies need to be applied, particularly if they're linked data-ready vocabularies. This is so important in that step of automatic reconciliation. 
The second thing we noticed is that many of us who have special collections have lots of materials that are described with local terms. And this can be kind of the wild west of metadata because people just throw everything that they don't know where it goes into the local term field. And we've spent some time this past year trying to apply some rigor to local terms so that they can operate and be used the same way well-established controlled vocabularies are. And once you have those two things in place, control of local terms and use of well-established controlled vocabularies, then you can access the unique resource identifier URI. And you can reuse existing URIs that are already um, being used by those who manage controlled vocabularies or you can assign URIs yourself for local terms. And this is the key to making things machine readable in linked open data. So we noticed that we have a couple of issues in our current metadata process when we create metadata. We often focus on getting the collection um, that we're working on up and accessible, and we're really focused just on one collection which can cause um, problems because of the narrow focus and we're only looking at metadata consistency in a small portion of the overall digital library. Second, as I mentioned, not much rigor is applied to entering controlled vocabulary terms. We have a variety of everyone from professional librarians to volunteers working on our collections. So we have a lot of misspellings, use of terms that don't match preferred terms, um, and very um, messy control of our local terms. And this all ends up with very difficult um, situations trying to identify relationships within and across the collections. So if you also have legacy metadata, what do you do with it? And I get this question a lot. And so I wanted to just mention two practical things that um, we started using and I think anyone could use in their repository as well. First one is the application profile. And we had an application profile at UNLV uh, several years ago it was created, but it was a somewhat static piece of paper and it's evolved with the project on linked data into something much more dynamic and living. Um, the application profile is now updated for any new collection, for any um, new practice we begin to implement in our metadata workflow, and even sometimes we make decisions to get rid of um, an old vocabulary that we're no longer using or something along those lines, and this document is a place to store that information, including um, specifics on which metadata terms we're using, the source of those terms, how metadata creators should express those terms when they're creating the metadata, and the labels that users see when they access the collections online. This application profile has been really helpful in increasing consistency of our content across all of the digital collections. So someone working on an oral history collection doesn't go so far down the path of specializing the metadata that um, it becomes completely difficult to make it interoperable with, say, an image collection. We also hope that it improves user interactions with the digital collections by offering them a more uni un uniform experience. And it has helped us in creating training materials and indexing guidelines for our metadata creators. Additionally, um, facilitating transformation to linked data um, has been another outcome. But even if you're not interested in doing linked data right now, applying um, some some of these concepts coming up with an application profile, these are all things that will greatly increase the quality of your metadata and can also help um, with compliance if you're part of a regional or nat national aggregated digital library. So the well-established controlled vocabularies are key to using URIs. 
and the rules of data entry that we've established help with the reconciliation. Um, both the local controlled vocabularies and the shared vocabularies that we've created that um, work across all collections are very, very important to allowing um, interlinking and increasing the potential for linking among local terms. So controlled vocabularies um, are part of many librarians' life, but cleaning and normalizing controlled vocabularies and making sure that they're working at the best possible level um, is not a fun process. It's time consuming and it does require a little bit of attention. So what we have done is, is chosen specific collections that are high priority to do cleaning on the controlled vocabulary. And we've put most of our focus on retraining metadata creators so that they understand that they are not just doing data entry, that they are um, part of an evolving role that really is um, so important in the quality of data contributions that we make and, and trying to um, help metadata cre creators really understand their position in access for our users. We've also redesigned our workflows a bit so that there are more checkpoints along the way for quality um, and so that less um, uncontrolled activity is happening with the metadata. Um, but we are trying to encourage people to think more about being data managers instead of just being data entry technicians. So this has resulted in a new role for people in our staff, and that is the maintenance of these URIs that we're now assigning um, to our metadata. And so things like terms and authoritative names that have URIs, we needed to manage those in such a way that we knew um, the status of them. So that has been one outcome of all this work with controlled vocabulary. In addition, we've had to come up with new processes to synchronize what's going on in our content DM collection with what we're doing in our linked data set. And it is a parallel process. We are not um, to the point where it is one integrated process. So there is that syncing that needs to happen. And it's not, um, it's not prohibitive to uh, our workflow, but it, it is something to keep in mind that if we uh, do quite a bit of work outside of our digital asset management system, how does that get fed back into it? And we have um, a new process where metadata creators are much, much more aware of relationships and being, um, being part of the process of identifying relationships and enriching metadata um, with those relationship pieces of information so that they can connect with um, external data sets. So I wanted to mention two tools. I've already spoken about OpenRefine, which we use for reconciliation and normalization. But we also use an open source product called Tematrez, which is a vocabulary management tool that lets us track the status of each term that we're using and allows us to give different users different levels of rights for um, submitting terms, approving terms, and administering terms for our local vocabularies. So Team of Trust has been great for allowing us to manage our local voc vocabularies, adding in the relationships, adding in alternative names, and capturing any research that people do to verify people or, or corporate names or terms in um, a system that doesn't um, just let that, that information um, get lost with the metadata creator. So a couple mi milestones have been reached. We adopted the Tematrez Local Controlled Vocabulary Management System. And we are using OpenRefine for cleanup reconciliation and RDF creation. In addition, we've adopted an approach that really tries to consider all of our individual digital collections as part of an integrated digital library. And by that, I mean not only integrated with other collections in Content DM, but integrated with other digital library collections in the region, nationally, and you know, 
up to the standard of international sharing. And at this point, I did want to stop and mention um, that all of this work with linked data can also be seen as part of an overall data flow. And if we think of our repositories and the information they contain as our data lakes, where we keep our data, but it's contained, um, our goal should be moving forward to share our data lakes with the overall data stream. And the stream is really the process um, by which the sharing happens. But as we all know, we don't want to share data lakes that are polluted and disgusting with nice, clean data streams of water. So what our local opportunity is, is trying to take responsibility and clean our data lakes so that as we move toward a more global opportunity where data streams are merging, um, the upstream data that we're receiving and the downstream data that becomes our shared data are all contributing to an overall quality of data. So I encourage you to look at Thomas Redmond's data-driven publication. He talks a lot about this concept that I think is really relevant to libraries. And it's really not just one library. I think it's important that we think about the optimization of process not being just an individual library's responsibility. We can work on the UNLV process forever, but it really doesn't matter until we collectively are um, in line with what the linked open data community is doing and what other libraries are doing. And I don't want um, to be too internally focused. I think that this work is very much a community and collaborative effort. And the goal of our project, I think, in my mind was simply to show and empower other librarians that it is possible and that you can join in this movement if you have an interest to do so. So there are some challenges of automatic reconciliation, including whether or not you get a full match, a partial match, no match, <laughs> or there are all sorts of terms that are used in um, automatic reconciliation. But I think that in real life scenarios, this is just another place where we work on data quality and the work that um, makes up the data lake. Um, just be aware that a lot of people practice the automatic reconciliation in our workshops and they think it's great, well, there is always a catch to everything. And sometimes we do have um, real life scenarios where there isn't a match because it's a local term, or there isn't a match because the term is ambiguous, or you're matching on things that maybe you shouldn't be matching on at all if you know the context of the collection. So the next steps for our project at this point are to publish our data, which is actually um, completed now and can be um, accessed. We are also working to interlink with other data sets. And this is in progress as we're identifying others working in the linked open data community who might have other collections on similar topics, um, including those on the Mountain West or um, other subject areas. We've been working quite a bit on documentation. So I, I say this over and over and over that everything we do, we should document so that our training for our staff, our manuals for metadata, our workshops, all of that should be open and shared with others so that they don't have to start from scratch. Um, my co-lead on this project and I are just two academic librarians who um, have other duties in our jobs besides linked open data. So this was um, a lot of learning, a, a pretty steep learning curve, and we'd like to uh, save others from having to start from scratch. And then circling back to a previous point, I think interface design and development is an area that we really need to work more on. Um, we have documented two experiments with interface design and development that I'll share on the next slide. And we are also working currently on a way to visualize our Jewish heritage project, focusing in on people, 
organizations and corporate bodies. And that's, um, that's an area that I think is really fascinating and will be ripe for lots of investigations in the future. In addition, um, next year we hope to work on some collaborative activities with regional controlled vocabularies, and we need to tackle EAD finding aid metadata as well as newspaper metadata. So hierarchy um, has a different requirement in the data model, and so we haven't spent as much time working on that, and that's um, on the agenda for next year. So as I mentioned, we did two experiments with visualizing our linked open data. And I share the links here um, if you would like to go and see the software and how it looks when it's presented. Um, these videos we use in demonstrations where we actually show them and talk while they're going. So um, they take up a little bit of time, and I didn't want to use up too much time in this presentation. But feel free to go and, and access them and look at them. The two software packages are Virtuoso Pivot Viewer and RHEL Finder. And they're both um, open, for, open source and free, so you, you do um, have access to using them. I'll mention that out of the box um, is about as far as we got with these when it came to customizing them. You do need programming experience that we as li librarians in an academic library focused on metadata just don't have. So um, for a project that we're working on at the moment with our Jewish heritage collection, we actually have contracted with um, a programmer who's working on taking inspiration from these two different software presentations and making something that um, is simpler and that can be customized to that collection. And that project is due in late June, so I will be happy to share that when that goes public. I also want wanted to mention that we have some resources on how to do this if you are interested. Um, in particular, we have articles we've written on preparing controlled vocabularies, on changing staff roles. An actual script is the third one in the list for transforming digital collections metadata into linked open data using OpenRefine. Um, and the last one is a, a basic overview of linked open data that we um, wrote at the beginning of our, of our um, production phase. So if you're interested, that might be um, a way to get us start without starting from square one. So I hope that in the near future, UNLV will be one small little tiny dot somewhere in the linked data cloud. And um, my hope is to see you all there with us. So I'll leave you with this um, contact slide. And I've linked to our UNLV link data blog, which has those presentations. It's a little bit inactive right now, but it's a good place to go if you want to see more about the project, um, as well as my email and my project co-lead Sylvia Southwick's email. We are always interested in talking with people about linked open data. So please feel free to contact us, and we'd love to hear what kind of projects you're working on as well. So thank you very much. That's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Corey. So again, everyone, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, type them in the chat. Or uh, go ahead and take the mic. And uh, Corey will be happy to entertain those. Yes, that's a question for me. <laughs> um, there you go. So there's the slide uh, with the contact info. I just wanted to make sure everyone saw the uh, sort of details there for how to ask questions. Um, we've got at least one person typing, so we'll give them a moment. Ooh, two people typing, Corey, here on the hook. Corey, could you talk about 
about querying linked data? Sure, I'd be happy to. I I will admit that I have less experience with this side of things because um, we've been working so much on the transformation. But I can say that um, one thing that's been very interesting is that there's a language that's used to query linked open data triples called Sparkle. And it is relatively easy for um, anyone who, who just has a couple hours to sit down and look at it to um, quickly formulate Sparkle queries to do uh, basic queries of the linked data triple store. For instance, um, in the presentations that I've given you the links for, we've done basic Sparkle queries for um, a subject, for a creator, um, for, for various uh, different sort of standard database queries. Um, what the power of Sparkle offers is something that, that really does require uh, programming expertise because you can string together very complex um, queries that can bring together um, lots of different aspects of the triples, lots of subjects, lots of predicates, lots of objects um, in a more complex way. What's interesting is that when these are visualized um, in such a way that you can see and reveal the relationships, usually the predicate of the triple. Um, it's very interesting. For instance, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, when we work with our oral history collection in Content DM, people have to query full text and they may or may not understand um, without reading the full transcript all the rich content in that transcript. When we query the oral history collection in linked data, um, it's visual, it's represented in a graph, and all of a sudden you can see not only the narrator that you may have searched for, but you can see their spouse, you can see their children, you can see their employer, you can see um, the subject that they spoke about, as well as um, things like, you know, we can easily show um, a Wikipedia or DVPedia version of Wikipedia um, connected data set that's already out there in the linked data cloud. So all of a sudden, our small local history collection is connecting to larger data sets like Wikipedia. And this is a really compelling way for researchers to kind of follow their nose depending on where their research interest lies rather than just getting to one set of search results and stopping and having to repeat the search. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, that that's one thing I think is really interesting about querying linked data. Great. We have a second question, or first a comment. Great talk. <laughs> Do you see linked data growing faster for material objects like photographs than for intangible concepts like dates? Hmm, that's a very good question. I, I think that there are advantages um, for the tangible concepts because we often have that data available to us more quickly when we are originally describing the material. For instance, um, there's a big distinction to be made between um, a photograph that may have a caption on it identifying a person um, versus a metadata creator having to guess from that person's clothing what era um, or what circa date or what date the photograph was taken. So I think on the metadata creator and um, certainly linked data will be generated more quickly with existing or more concrete um, descriptive data that comes with, with images. But I think um, the more compelling and interesting aspects of linked data are often in things that are intangible. And so by working with curators and by working with um, collection managers who know the content, I think we can capture that and store it uh, not only in the metadata but in this new linked open data way and then share that with users um, in really interesting ways. Great. Thank you for that. I am going to, I think, wrap up the Q&A on this one. We're uh, 
right on time today, so that's fantastic. Um, if you do have additional questions for Corey, um, please do feel free to, to chat them, and I'll make sure to uh, keep track of that, and um, we'll come back to that later. And again, Corey, of course, if you can't stay, um, I'll get those questions back to you. Um, but folks can feel free to contact Corey directly um, via the email that is by request on the slides in front of you. So thank you again, Corey.